about um, abandoned mine drainage, and we have some very fine minds here to lead us through this discussion. Bob Hedden is the founder and president of Hedden Engineering. Hedden Environmental. Hedden, uh, sorry, Hedden Environmental. And he is a, a locally well-known and renowned expert in abandoned mine drainage and abandoned mine drainage treatment. Our other guest today is Royce Renyak, the um, executive director of the Allegheny Land Trust. They put together funding for, um, and CLS, we're proud to say, we helped and we partnered in this opportunity. But ALT put together a funding package and purchased the piece of property previously known as the Winfield Pines Golf Course. Uh, the property has a known abandoned mine drainage problem and dumps thousands of gallons of uh, mine drainage into Chartier's Creek on a daily basis. ALT has agreed to tackle the problem and remediate the, um, the contaminated waters before the water and then put the water back into Chartier's Creek cleaned up. So I thank you for coming today and I'm pleased to turn things over to these gentlemen. Good afternoon. Um, as Dan said, my name is Roy Cranick. I'm the executive director of the Allegheny Land Trust. And uh, I'm just going to speak for five minutes and then turn it over to, to Bob to talk about uh, the uh, A and B challenge that we have at Winfield Pines. Allegheny Land Trust is a nonprofit 501c3 organization, and uh, we are celebrating our 10th year as a land trust. And we've got about 950 acres conserved, primarily in Allegheny County. Uh, about 150 acres are in Washington County. Um, our mission is to help local people save local land. And an example of that is the Winfield Pines property that you will see here very soon. Um, just a few, uh, a little bit of history about uh, Winfield Pines. It was a property that uh, we've been working on for quite a few years to conserve, and we did finally purchase the property in December of 2001. Since then, we've been working very, very hard on two initiatives. One is to figure out what to do with the existing buildings that were on the site. As you know, it used to be a golf and spin club, and um, we tried for about a year, a year and a half, to find users for the building. Uh, from a conservation perspective, we felt that it was very important to try to recycle and reuse the infrastructure that was there. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to do that, and um, we had some funding come available through uh, the uh, work of uh, uh, former Senator Murphy um, to demolish the building, and that's what we are doing now. Um, you'll see one of the buildings is almost entirely demolished. The old bathhouse and the clubhouse is being used by the local fire department for some training um, before they ultimately burn that down. The second uh, initiative that we're involved with at Winfield Pines is the cleanup of the abandoned mine drainage. We're trying to stop about 43 tons, I think that's right, of iron um, being loaded into the stream uh, Chartier's Creek on an annual basis. So we could have, after buying the property, said, okay, our, our job's done, we've conserved it. But no, we're taking the extra step and um, confronting these challenges of the building demolition as well as the data mine drainage cleanup. Um, Bob's gonna talk about the process by which we're going to do that. And um, just, I wanna frame that by saying that we've got a pretty serious challenge with cleaning this up because the property runs primarily south to north, very rectilinear, and the abandoned mine drainage is at the north end or the low end of the property. So we've got to bring the water somehow uphill to treat it before it goes back into Chartier's Creek. Um, before I introduce or let Bob take over, I have to recognize some folks that really made this project happen. This was the largest project that we were ever involved in. We paid $450,000 for this piece of property. And uh, prior to that, we had smaller, much smaller projects, $50,000 projects and whatnot. Uh, Senator Murphy was a key, key player. Uh, current Senator Murphy, Pippi, uh, <laughs> is, uh, was a strong uh, 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 partner as well as uh, Representative Marr. And I have to emphasize the work of CLS, the local folks in the community that really worked very, very hard on this project with us, raising some dollars um, to make the purchase possible. And uh, you may have read about uh, resident Rob McLaughlin's contribution of painting uh, to the project that um, the Mellon Financial Corporation bought, and we used that money to help buy the land. So we'll walk the site uh, after Bob's presentation, and I'd be happy to talk to you, know, you about uh, more details concerning uh, the project. Bob. Thank 
Thanks, Roy. Okay, I'm Bob Hedden, and I, um, I grew up in Swickley, and um, I um, went to school to do environmental studies at the St. Lawrence University, and then did a PhD in ecology at Rutgers, where I met my wife Beth, who's sitting back there, brought her back to Pittsburgh, and we moved to um, Mount Lebanon, so I learned about the other side of Liberty Tubes, which I never had been through, but, but by mistake <laughs> earlier for the first half of my life. And, um, and worked actually as a research scientist with the old U.S. Bureau of Mines, which is down in Brewston. There's still a facility there. The Bureau of Mines is gone. Newt Gingrich got it, and Mr. Reagan got rid of it. Um, and, and I left the Bureau of Mines and started my own consulting service, and which is head environmental, and this is what I do. I, my research program when I was with the Bureau of Mines had to do with abandoned mine drainage, and being a biologist, how to deal with it in a passive way. And so I helped develop some of the passive technologies that we're gonna bring to bear here at the Wingfield Pine site. And that's what I do for a living. I'm, my firm is six people and we do mine drainage and which is suitable for passive treatment. And I work with a lot of watershed groups. So I thought I'd give you a little background on mine drainage and then talk about the Wingfield Pine site so then we can get out there and you'll have an idea what you're seeing. And figure out how to manage this part. guys see over there by stand here okay well mine drainage is a very serious problem in Appalachia in anywhere that where mine has where coal has been mined over 5,000 miles in the eastern United States are polluted by water flowing from over 5,000 miles of streams are polluted by water flowing from mines that were abandoned Mined and abandoned before there were any environmental laws requiring putting responsibility on the owners to clean up the water. And in fact, there's been no grandfathering of, of any kind of environmental responsibility. And so there's thousands and thousands of abandoned mines which, pollute, which produce pollution, which pollute streams. And the only way that's getting fixed right now is generally through, um, through the efforts of government groups and watershed groups to use government funding to do that. Um, Pennsylvania is the, sing, has, is the state with the largest amount of abandoned mine drainage and polluted streams. And it's, it is the biggest problem in Pennsylvania. It's the most per pervasive problem in EPA Region 3. It's the biggest problem in Pennsylvania is abandoned mine, land, abandoned mine drainage, also known as acid mine drainage. This is, just, this is not Wingfield Pines. It's just a picture just to give you an idea. This actually, if any of you have ever, this is um, called the Douglas discharge. It's from a mine in um, Soutersville, Pennsylvania. If you ever do the trail that goes from West Newton to Soutersville, and you, you, you'll see in Soutersville, the trail crosses a very orange stream. That, is, that stream is Douglas Run, and this is the reason it's orange. This is a several thousand gallon per minute discharge that flows from an abandoned mine back up there in the hill. This is, um, this is um, Douglas Run before upstream. So it's a, I don't know if a high quality is the right word, but it's a, it's a viable ecosystem. There's fish that live in it. You can see where the discharge comes in and you go downstream and the stream is completely colored orange, pigmented orange by the iron that's in the water, the iron oxide. And that's the way it goes into the Yakagani River. And if you do that trail, a lot of the tributaries that come into the Yakagani River are this color. Well, that, that color and the, the AMD, the, the mine drainage, it's ecologically de devastating in many cases, but also it limits public uses of the water. That water, if you were to take that into your household, you'd have to clean it up to drink it, and also you'd have to clean it up before you could use it to wash your clothes because iron is a very good pigment and it will stain your clothes and your, your fixtures. <clears throat> well, this is just a list of streams that come to mind to me um, here in western Pennsylvania that, that are polluted by mine drainage. Not all of them, not the full lengths of these streams, but all of these streams have some portions that have substantial mine drainage on it. And it's not so hard anywhere in western Pennsylvania if you get in the habit like I am, every time I go down in a hill, you're eventually gonna cross a stream to look on the bridge, look down and see what you're crossing. I would say 30% of the time what you're crossing is orange. And um, it's from the mine drainage. Well, these are, discharges that flow, that abandoned, di abandoned discharges or streams that are polluted by abandoned coal mine drainage in the Chartiers Creek watershed. And I have been involved also with the Chartiers Nature Conservancy, who has a, um, I'm a member, I've been a member for a long time, I'm involved 
with the Scott Conservancy and with the Mount Lebanon Conservancy. I live, you know, obviously I live here. And um, we've been involved for the last two years in documenting large deep mine discharges into the main stem of Chartier's Creek. And um, these are some of the, our, our surveys have identified these areas as being really substantial, places of substantial inflows of polluted water. And starting from the, the Chartier's Creek south and moving north, which is moving from downstream, from upstream, downstream, Wingfield Pines is actually the first point of untreated polluted coal mine drainage. It goes into Chartier's Run, Chartier's Creek. You move downstream about half a mile and Coal Run comes in. That's an orange stream if you're in Bridgeville and you're just leaving Bridgeville going south towards the Shop and Save, you cross a very orange stream. That's Coal Run. Um, Miller's Run is, a, is, of course, the stream that, that goes alongside Route 50 as you head out to South Fayette. It's polluted by a very large discharge in the town of Gladden, which is about, three, about five miles upstream in Miller's Run from Chartier's Creek. If you know Presto Saigon Road, there's a soccer fields down there. South Fayette has some soccer fields. That runs along Chartier's Creek. Lots of discharges along that road with, from old abandoned mines. <coughs> McLaughlin Run in the town of Bridgeville. McLaughlin Run is clean up in this portion, but when you get down into Bridgeville, eventually when you get down, if you get to a point where you cross over it, down before it goes into the old back channel of Chartier's Creek, which is down in Bridgeville, it's bright orange. If you work your way back, you'll find there's a large discharge right in a residential part of Bridgeville from an old mine coming out from a, a pipe that goes back in the hill that pollutes McLaughlin Run. Painter's Run has a little bit of, of mine drainage um, right around the tire place, if you know Painter's Run Road. They're down there, you're getting below the coal. There's some mine drainage that comes in there. Woodville is the name we give to a discharge that is, that is um, coming out, um, Chemtech, I think that's the name of the building. It's the Chemtech building on Route 50. If you're sitting at a light there and you look over at the hill behind Chemtech, you will see an orange splash. That orange splash is what we call the Woodville discharge because it's the old town of Woodville. Big discharge with a lot of iron. Scrub grass is the same coal mine that's around the bend in Scott Township, the scrub grass site. Hope Hollow, if you go down um, Hope Hollow Road and the stream that um, follows Hope Hollow Road down into um, Heidelberg, that would be, I think, um, is polluted by several discharges. Robinson Run, heading out towards um, west, you know, sort of towards the airport, has lots and lots of discharges. I've been involved out there with the Botanical Garden. As some of you, I'm sure some of you are members of the, I would think, the, know about the Botanical, the Western Pennsylvania Horticultural Society is, is building a Botanical Garden out, um, out near um, Settler's Cabin, and their property they have a nice piece of property on the top, it's an old farm, completely ringed by strip mines and completely undermined by underground coal mines, very bad acid mine drainage, which we've been involved in assessing and that will be part of their whole plan out there is eventually to collect that and fix it. Because right now the entrance to the park, to the garden, will be right next to all this polluted water. So they need to fix that. Um, and lastly, Whiskey Run is a stream in Green Tree. And that's, that's about the last major inflow to, to Chartier's Creek. So lots of mine drainage here in the Chartier's Creek watershed that we need to work on. Not gonna go into it too much, but the, the reason that you get polluted mine drainage is you have it, pyrite, which is in the coal or in the overburden in the rocks associated with the coal, usually in the, the rock, the shale right above the coal. Pyrite, this is, you see that S there, that sulfur, this is the same thing that we talk about, high sulfur coal. This is generally what we're talking about. It's what makes acid rain when you burn it and it comes back down. It's what makes acid mine drainage when it stays in the ground and it interacts with oxygen and water. When those two interact, you have reactions happen and you form iron hydroxide or iron oxide. That's the orange color. You form sulfate, which doesn't have any kind of deleterious effect and we don't worry about sulfate and you get H pluses, which is acidity, and potentially you get very acid drainage. Potentially you get very acid drainage, but it depends on what other rocks are there. If there's alkaline rocks, limestone or just limey shales associated with the coal, you get an alkaline drainage that has, I skipped there, I'm down here, you get an alkaline drainage that has a lot of iron in it. If you don't have those alkaline rocks, you get an acid drainage with a lot of heavy other metals in it. But we have at Wingfield Pines, and in most of the South Hills, is there's enough alkalinity in the rocks that the discharges 
tend to be alkaline, but they're still very polluted with iron, and they get that orange color. So the Wingfield Pines discharge, as I mentioned, it's the first major source of unpolluted water to Chartier's Creek. Now, Consol operates a very large pump and treat facility down off Donald, down, um, it's called the Han plant, it's down at Donaldson's Crossroads. It's from their old Montour mine, and they actually pump water out of the mine there and treat it and discharge that in, into Chartier's Creek. It's totally treated, there's no problem with it. If they were to ever, if something would ever happen to Consol, and they didn't leave behind enough money to run that plant, and they turned off the, the, the pumps, that water would eventually discharge either from the Mayview mine or at Wingfield Pines. That is the next place if that, the, if that mine floods where the, the, their, their entries intersect with the surface, okay? So um, it's good that Consol is treating that. It's very important that everybody who cares about Chartier's Creek always keep a good, an eye on that treatment system and make sure that the DEP keeps an eye on that treatment system. They're doing a great job right now. Um, the Wingfield Pine site was, um, there's the map here that some of you were looking at. It's, the, it's a mining map. It appears that, um, it doesn't appear, it was, the coal on either side of the Wingfield Pine site was mined apparently in the 1920s, a long time ago. This block of coal that became the Wingfield Pine site was, must have been kept, somebody else owned it. They didn't allow it to be mined until the 1940s. And between 1947 and 1950, the, the Easy coal along the creek was strip mined, and the deep, the deeper coal was deep mined. And there's the map shows all the the whole all the workings on the hill that goes behind, below Mayfield Road, um, Mayview Road, and all, all the now the housing back there. It's a really neat map. We might want to look at it there. The, it might be easier at the site. They actually Mayview Road was a feature then because they actually didn't mine as intens as intensively under Mayview Road to keep it from subsiding and being being damaged. So um, a neat map. It's neat that we have such a good map because we really understand what's going on in the mine. A lot of these cases, we don't have good maps. Um, as Roy said, the, you know, the site's been through a lot over the last 50 years, but now it's owned by the Allegheny Land Trust. And um, my involvement, the reason I'm able to stand here and tell you about this, is that the, um, Roy and the Land Trust was able to obtain some money through Pennsylvania's Growing Greener Program to to come up with a plan. And that's, that's what I was hired by the land trust to, to help them with. This is just a picture of the site. We'll see this, not, not as much snow. Well, it'll just be mud now, mud and water. But um, this is the high wall. For those of you who mind, what they did is they, they stripped away the coal where the coal was shallow. They actually came in, and this is the late 40s, with probably very simple, I don't even know what kind of equipment, but not, not too heavy duty equipment. They were able to strip away about that much of the overburden and get to the coal and scoop it up and sell it that way. From this point on, it was too expensive to take any more of the overburden, so that's where they started the deep mine, and they went, they drove entries down into the under, underground, and then they developed a whole deep mine underneath the hill behind here. But so that's important, because what, what, what is the case here is all the land that we're going to build on is real, has been strip mined, it's spoil. It's, it's the overburdened rocks that were blasted apart, moved out of the way, before the coal was taken and then put back. So um, don't have any native soils to speak of in here. This is where the water comes out. The water comes out, it's obviously, an, it's an engineered structure. It was, it's the intended point for the mine to discharge. We don't know who built the structure. This is a concrete structure that is over. It looks like a pipe that extends back into the hill and go into a mine. And the location of this is right where there was an, an, an opening on the map. So this is the intended point for the water to come out of the mine. I wish we knew who intended it to come out here, but we can't seem to find that out at this time. Um, we will be seeing this, and you'll see much better than is shown in this picture. There's a hole in the bottom of this pipe, and there's a lot of water coming out of it. Flows into a pond. The pond is varying. Um, it's green. It's orange. It varies on the day and, and the color. We'll see this pond. And then this is the water that goes straight to Chartier's Creek. Okay, well this is the characteristics of the discharge. Flows at 1,500 gallons per minute. Perspective, your garden hose, full tilt, is five gallons a minute. This is a lot of water, okay? Um, a, a, you know, McLaughlin run during the summertime here 
when it's base flow, it doesn't flow, I doubt it flows anything anywhere near 1,500 gallons per minute. There's a lot of water. It comes out continuously at a high, high flow rates. Um, and just for another perspective, that's about, um, that's about one and a half million gallons per day, almost two million gallons per day of water. Um, the pH is six, 6.2. This is not acid water, this is alkaline water. If the pH, what is the, when the pH is between six and eight, we call it, we call it alkaline mine drainage. This is alkaline. It's got a lot of alkalinity, 425 milligrams per liter. That's a lot of alkalinity. That's the buffering capacity that gives streams and waters the ability to, to neutralize acid rain, any kind of acid inputs. This water actually, from that perspective, is a very good thing for Structures Creek. It's putting a lot of buffering capacity into it. So that shows there's a lot of alkaline rocks in the, associated with the coal seam. But 14 milligrams per liter iron. Drinking water standard, 0.3 milligrams per liter iron. In-stream standard for designated use, which means to have Chartier's Creek be a good warm water fishery, one and a half milligrams per liter iron. So actually, we're going to see an example here. There's a lot of streams and a lot of discharges that are much worse than this. And in the watershed, you've got the scrub grass in Scott Township, and those discharges are in the order of 75 milligrams per liter iron. So this is not the worst stuff, but still, that's 150,000 pounds per year of iron solids that are going into Chartier's Creek. Now, in a day like today, when the streams are high, it doesn't have that big an effect. But when it does is when you go out there in, in August, in September and October when the, when the flows are low, it actually does very clearly impact Chartier's Creek um, under those low flow conditions. Those of you in the numbers, this is the kind of data we get. And um, um, this was provided by the um, Citizens for Land Stewardship. They collected um, these samples. I think Mrs. Page did, did most of this. I just did one here to verify things. Um, those are all milligrams per liter pH, milligrams per liter of alkalinity, no acidity, milligrams per liter of iron, manganese, and aluminum. The um, aluminum's darker, that means it's below detection. Aluminum is a big concern with aquatic ecosystems. And when you have acid mine drainage, when you have aluminum, it's very toxic. We don't even have aluminum detectable here. Aluminum is not a deal. Manganese is, is a concern when it gets, well, this in the regulations, when it gets above two milligrams per liter, I think biologically it's not really a concern unless we get above 10 milligrams per liter. Obviously, we're very low in manganese. Iron is the deal here. And actually, you, we, you, you will find organisms living in alkaline water with this much iron in it, but you won't find high quality organisms because of all the iron will suffocate anything trying to live on the bottom. But you'll find carp living in water like this and, and some bugs. Okay, so what are we going to do? Um, because this is an alkaline discharge, that opens up opportunities. It turns out that the passive treatment of mine drainage using ponds and wetlands, using natural processes that don't involve pumping or the use of energy or the use of chemicals, those passive techniques work best when you have alkaline water polluted with iron. That's where they work. So that's what we can do here. Um, what happens is that the iron is, is removed as an, as an oxide solid and is precipitated in the pond and wetland. And you try to build, you design them so that those reactions happen to their fullest extent in the ponds and wetlands and you capture all the iron before it goes into the creek. Actually, what we're doing is nothing different than what's happening in the creek now. We're just trying to collect that iron before it gets to the creek. So what we want to do here is we want to build ponds that will hold back the iron, hold back the water, and allow these reactions to occur. And these ponds will store a bulk of the iron and then we're going to build wetlands to polish the water, to clean out that little bit of extra water, that iron that's left, and make sure we have a very good discharge. And this is just a cartoon showing the idea. Put a pond first, take out most of the iron. A wetland, you take out the remaining iron. And if you have a manganese issue, the manganese will come out too. We don't need to worry about that here. This is a neat site. If any of you are interested in this site, this is a great place, St. Vincent College. Anytime, if you're in La Trobe, you should make a trip to see the, um, the grist mill, which is the, the whole renovated old grist mill. You can see how the, um, the brothers at St. Vincent College have been making flour for, you know, fr from their grain they grow there for a cent centuries. But right next to the grist mill is a large deep mine discharge, which is alkaline and has iron in it. And they have built 
a wetland system here, and this is actually where the water comes out of the mine, right here. And um, it's a really remarkable system, because as you walk through it, and you see the water go from bright orange to less orange to less orange to brown to clear. It actually clears up, and the, the model here is the same as what we're going to do at Wingfield Pines. It's ponds which blend into wetlands. Just a little bit of data to show you the kind of experience we're having at St. Vincent College. This is the iron coming in. It's about 90 milligrams per liter. Wingfield Pines is 15, okay? Much higher iron. Here's the iron going out is the blue. It turns, you know, actually, if you look at that a lot, you see that what happens is in the wintertime when the flows go up, that's when you get these little bumps. January, 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 and January. So what happens is you get a very clear, beautiful discharge in the, in the summertime, in the fall, and you get little bumps up to six or seven milligrams per liter out in the, um, in the winter time. And actually, as far as the creeks there, that's good for them because it's the base flow, it's the low flow times when you want to have the cleanest water. Very successful. So we're going we're gonna to use that. You know, that's, that system is sort of a model that a lot of people are using to treat alkaline iron contaminated water. So what we're going to do at Wingfield Pines is we're going to build ponds that are going to remove a majority of the iron um, as a sludge. You, know, you end up with an iron sludge. And we're going to design those ponds so that we can easily get in there and take that sludge out every seven to 10 years. So we'll, we'll be able to clean them out without breaking the, the land trust every 10 years. The, then the water will go from those ponds into constructed wetlands which we won't build to clean out because they will accumulate iron, but it won't, it'll be on the order of um, you know, a centimeter, or less than a centimeter per year. They will, they will be designed to clean, polish the water, but they'll be designed for wildlife and for aesthetic values. And um, we're also, this is a, you know, if you've ever been to St. Vincent College, you know that that, that system, that system at St. Vincent College has become the center of their whole environmental education program. And there's no reason why with everything that's happening, at Mayview Road, you know, and, and everything's going on out there, this should be the same way. And I'm sure this will become the same way. And the ponds will be neat when they'll be orange, but actually I think some of the really neat stuff could happen in, with these wetlands. And with 1,500 gallons per minute of water, we can dump that right into the creek, or maybe, maybe we'll find something really interesting to do with that water. And I'm not even sure what that is right now. You know, it could be, there could be fishing ponds down there. The, definitely we could have fishing ponds with this water. We could do whatever, but I think we're going to, think creatively about what to do with all this water once we get all the iron out of it. OK, what's the scale going to be? The way that we design these systems, we understand how fast iron is removed passively in a pond and in a wetland. And that's what this rate of iron removal is. A pond that receives water with this kind of chemistry tends to remove about five grams of iron per square meter of wetland a pond per day. We know how many grams of iron are, every day are contained in the discharge. So by comparing those numbers, we can calculate that we're going to need to build about three and a half acres of ponds to remove 75% of the iron. Then we're going to remove, use wetlands to further polish. The wetlands, as, it's, as you get closer and closer to a low number, it gets harder and harder to get the iron out. The wetlands are not quite as efficient. We're figuring three grams per square meter per day then that means we have another three acres of wetlands. And by the time we get through that, we should have clean water, less than one milligram per liter iron. Both of these are about, you know, three and a half, three acres. When you do all your berms and everything, you have a footprint of about 10 acres there, okay, if we try to be efficient about laying it out. First cut, one reason I'm here is that I knew all that stuff. I made a first cut and said, you know, is this a, good, is this a project we can do? Because I, I do get asked to look, to look at projects, and when I look at the data, I say, you know, we're never, this is never going to work, and I hate to get involved in projects where it's all bad news. But here, the good news is what we're going to see today is we're going to see a lot more than 10 acres, and we're going to see 10 acres that actually looks like where you might even want to, where Roy and the land trust thinks the, the system should go anyway. There is about 10 acres of land that's already isolated in the um, southern part of the site. So land-wise, I think we're going to be able to make it here. OK, what about the iron? OK, um, another thing that I'm involved in is that being involved in taking iron out of water for watershed groups. And um, I've, I've been asked and wondered for years, couldn't we do something with the iron? It seems like if you see these systems, they're just 
when you see a functioning system, it seems so perfect. Dirty water, ponds and wetlands, clean water, and, and the last part of the puzzle is what are you going to do with all that sludge? Can't you figure out a way to do that? And so I have, at least tentatively, it looks like I have recently been collecting sludge, processing it, and selling it as a pigment. The reason our streams are orange is that it's just misplaced pigment in my mind now. We've got all this pigment in the mine water. It's in the wrong place. It shouldn't be in our streams, and everyone should know that. It should be in ponds, and eventually it should be in paint and wood stain and um, concrete. So one of the things that I presented to the trust when my pitch to them was that we were going to design these ponds to allow us to periodically come in and clean them out and take a good chunk of the iron, the iron that comes out in the ponds, out and try to and sell it. And I'm confident it can be sold. This is good clean iron from these systems is, is, is marketable iron, which has a value of about 15 cents a pound. The challenge to me is to be able to get it out and make it in a condition that I can sell for less than 15 cents a pound. And we're real close right now. And I really feel that you know, come, come 10 years from now, or it'll be more than that, when, when we're ready to clean out these ponds, I feel good that iron oxide recovery, my other little firm on the side, will be here to, to come in to, to Roy and the land trust and this, take away their sludge for free. Okay? And actually, if that gets done, then this system becomes almost maintenance free. You've got to cut the grass. You've got to keep the muskrats out. You've got to do varmint control. But if the sludge can be taken care of, then you've, you've gotten rid of your, your major long-term concerns. And here's just a picture of some of the iron I made from a abandoned mine site in Westmoreland County. We you know, processed it, stacked it up. And the neat thing is, I, I have one customer, you know, yeah. one customer. But one customer is Hoover Color Corporation. And they're, they're a company that mines iron oxides in Virginia. I truck them the mine drainage iron oxide. They dump it in their mine, in their mine area. And they have found they prefer, they, they can't mine stuff as good as what we're selling them, what we're sending them. And so they actually are. Are, they've incorporated into what they call their burnt sienna line. And, um, and it is now, they've come out with a premium product this year, which they're highlighting, which is based on our material. And they cannot make it unless we keep sending them stuff, because they can't mine stuff this pure. Um, we've get, we, we're giving it a name. I've got to turn this into a real business. We're calling it Environ Oxide. Okay? So it's environmental iron oxide. And everybody likes that name, so I'm, you know, we trademark that. I'm hoping that eventually, I'm trying to get Hoover to put that, that name on their stuff. And hopefully, we're going to have people who will ask for that Hoover color pigment, which has the environ oxide material in it. Um, it's, it's mainly used right now in wood stains. Apparently, um, it's a very, very good for a dark cherry wood stain. And Hoover says that if you go out and buy a cherry wood stain for anything you do, that's, and the stuff has been made in the last year, there's a very good chance it's made with, um, with our mine drainage stuff. Um, other things that we hope to get, okay, we, hopefully you'll be hearing about this more too down in the next year here is this, this effort to try to get watershed groups, municipalities, everybody to use envir Environ Oxide more. We've got the, um, the pigment that comes from Hoover Color that very readily goes into concrete and colors, colors concrete. I mean, here they chose to paint these blocks. These blocks could have been pigmented before they were, they were made, as they were made, and there'd be less painting involved. And in fact, many parts of the, in the southwestern United States, no, but very few people pour gray cement. They always add some pigment, maybe because they're more of an earth tone color down there, you know, but to make it blend in. And in fact, a lot of iron oxide, like we make, would go into coloring um, concrete. Um, Pruitt Schaefer is a paint company, a chemical company in McKees Rocks. I've been working with them. They're making paint. We're, we've made about 100 gallons of paint, and we're giving that to people, nonprofit groups who have projects, as long as they like barn red, because that's where we are right now. But if they like barn red, um, we can give you paint. And in fact, if there was a, a project around here that you were painting something and you, you like barn red, talk to me, because we're, we're in the Christmas mode here. Um, I'm trying to get people to use it and to get the word out. Um, we hope this spring to be making um, landscape products, you know, all the cement things you can buy now, the, the blocks and the pavers and all that stuff. And my wife is, is involved in, um, in a garden at Washington Elementary School in Mount Lebanon, and they have a whole area they need to block, and we're hoping to use some blocks that we make and pigment with iron oxide, environ oxide, in that project. And I'm also trying to get it into that wood mulch, you know, that obnoxious, 
obnoxious red, you know, wood mulch that everybody seems to buy and love. Um, that is iron oxide, that color, the, that material is a white, it's pallets. Generally that material is wood pallets that are ground up and pigmented red with iron oxide. And I'm trying to get us into that market too. And our color would be in more of a redwood color, which I think would be nice. But the, the mulch people say everybody wants the brightest red in the world. So we got to change that. Um, Wingfield Pines. So we're going to go to Wingfield Pines. <coughs> There's some issues out here. It's a developed site. There's a sewer line that crosses the site. We've got to figure out how to deal with that. There is surface water that drains through this site. There's a hill. There's a creek that goes through the site. We've got we to make sure we deal with that. Um, we've learned some things that are on this list. There's a big pile of dirt in the middle of the site, a berm that we'll see. We've learned that, that the origins of that is the, the Mayview um, Constructed Wetlands Project. There was apparently a lot of dirt dug out of there when they built those wetlands as part of the Pendate, Pendot Remedial, I think it was a uh, mitigation project. And that dirt apparently ended up at Wingfield Pines and at one time was where you'd, you, the driving range was apparently, you know, you're up on a hill. Um, we have that dirt there, we've learned that. Groundwater depth throughout the site, you're always concerned when you do a construction project, whether you're gonna run into water when you dig. We were digging there yesterday, we ran into water. You could dig down 20 inches and you're into water. And that's gonna be a concern. Now we, we're gonna have issues with digging deep ponds because it'll be too wet. What we really need to do is try to go up if we can. And that has to do then with the ability to raise the discharge and we'll talk about that. We're hoping that we can raise the discharge high enough so we can build a system on top of the Wingfield Pine site as opposed to digging something down into it. And um, I won't go into this very much. I, I think every, whoever's interested will talk about it out there, but it's, it is kind of neat about trying to raise the discharge and whether you can do that. It turns out that we have, you know, we have nature's engineers have been out there doing it already and they, some beavers dammed up the discharge and raised it three feet without a disaster occurring. So um, the challenge between me and Roy and the trust is to convince the trust that maybe we should try to even go a step further than the beavers and push it up three or four more feet higher than they got it. And just because if we can do that, we can make building of the system a lot easier. Um, but we'll talk about that when we're out there. And that's what I have. So I'll take any questions or whatever, however we want to do this. Well, they add an, an adhesive to it. It's like paint, you know, they actually put it on the chips and yes, I mean, if you ever look at those chips, they do fade with time. That iron ends, would end up in your soil. But it, I don't think, it's not the same as a concentrated slug of iron coming out of the water and hitting, coming out of a discharge and hitting a stream all at one time. I, I think that, that that is not, that would not degrade a stream unless we were to mulch the whole watershed. And that just doesn't, you know, I don't think it's going to happen to that extent. Well, that's going to come out somewhere else. It might come out on the site. There's a, there's a discharge, uh, an entry that was, we don't know, that was buried that is a little higher than the one we have now. You'd think it may come out there. Otherwise, we don't know. We would need to get more maps to figure that out. But it will come out somewhere else. Yes. Yes, we're going to raise the water level in the mine a few feet. Yeah. That's a map of the underground coal mine. And so all those, oh, that is the Wingfield Pine site. And I think if you all, when we're done here, we, sh we could all go stand there and look at it quickly. But it, it shows, that's the mine map that was developed in 1947 and 1948 to document the mining that went on at the site. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah, I do have one. Okay. Well, we need to just keep them out to, um, to who asked? I didn't, okay. Um, just for um, to keep the water flowing in the right direction, things like that. And muskrats can devastate your cat, your vegetation. I mean, we'll have to that, that's that'll be a challenge. At St. Vincent College, they um, muskrats devastated wetland three, and. They, it was a big decision. I'm on the, commit, the technical committee there about what to do about that, and they decided they had to manage the muskrats. And now the provost has a chart in his room. And, but it, I mean, literally, they've, they've trapped 
hundreds of muskrats out of those wetlands, and they just keep coming back in. That'll be a decision that somebody will have to decide. Do we, you know, what they do is they, they dig these swimming channels. And so the water comes into your big, beautiful three-acre wetland and flows right in the swimming channel right out. Oh, You've got to decide how important that is, you know. So they trap them. Basically. They trap them, yeah. They, they yeah, they're, <laughs> yeah. They're yeah, there's a lot of muskrat, yeah. <laughs> the world is, we're not running out of muskrats for a while, yeah. <laughs> well, that... This is the site. Do you want to talk about this, Roy? Uh, sure, I can talk about it. Um, it's basically a big oh. um, For those of you familiar with Maybe Road, Maybe Road comes along here and makes a sharp right. This is um, is that uh, not Sky Ridge? What's the name of that called? Like that Sky Ridge? Okay. Hilarious. Hilarious. Yeah. And then uh, maybe makes a kind of an S bend. This is the field. Boyce Mayview Field, where the um, EEC is supposed to be built. The old barn is right here. Um, if you're going this direction, there's a real sharp right-hand hairpin turn into the site. There's a paved driveway there. I think there's a sign that says hidden driveway. That's the access road down into Wingfield site. The property we own goes from approximately here to about here. It's about 4,000 feet from south to north. This is Chartier's Creek running along the property. We also have about eight to 10 acres on this side of the stream and uh, the railroad tracks as well. But we're gonna stay on this side today. Um, we'll come down and we'll park around here. You'll see this blue image is the uh, old former pool. This is the bathhouse and this is the clubhouse. This is the old tennis court shown here. So we'll drive down, we'll park in the parking lot and start walking this direction. And we'll probably stop right around here. You see where the berm is that um, Bob was talking about. Um, the soil that was brought in from the boy, uh, from the uh, maybe may wetlands. And from this point, um, this may be six or eight feet higher than the rest of the site. It's a good spot to stop and get a vantage, good vantage point to look to the north and to the south to get, really get a feel for the property. For those of you who are golfers, um, if you look at the site and kind of analyze it, you can see the remnants of the tees and the greens and the fairways, um, so on and so forth. So um, we'll walk up here. We'll stop up here. This is where the uh, discharge finally goes into Chartier's Creek. This here is basically the pond that Bob showed you a picture of, and the discharge is right here. So it comes out of that um, culvert into this pond and flows out and spills into Chartier's Creek right here. So we'll spend some time up in here, and we'll show you a few of the holes that we dug yesterday to find out what the soil structure was like and uh, how deep the groundwater was. Uh, then after that, you know, I'll stick around for a while. Uh, if you want, we can walk up to um, our southern boundary and, um, and show you around a little bit. This is the pond that we were ice skating on uh, a couple months ago, one, one beautiful full, full moon night. Any other questions? The gate will be open. The gate will be open. I have a key for the Well, we would check that. We, we would raise it slowly. If we go through with this, we'd put a structure in there that would allow us to raise it inches at a time. And um, so we would do that. We would run a trap line. I think we would look for, there's a discharge rate, there's a potential point right here on, on Roy's property, on the trust property. We would walk down on the adjacent, the, the next place you think it would come out would be on this adjacent property right here. Um, we would look, we would look for it. The fact that the water is so clean there makes, would lead us all to believe that there's a very substantial barrier between the mines. And actually, the mine map shows a very substantial barrier between the mines. So th there, there's some risk. But the, the good news here is that this is not, you know, this is not million dollar homes down here that you're sending water into somebody's garage. What will happen is if something, if something does happen, we'll start to see orange water seeping out of the side of the hill here. And then we'll know to stop or we'll assess whether Okay, well, maybe we, maybe we like the water coming out here better, you know. So on the map, you'll see there's another mine entrance right around this location where the children are. So does that prevent advent service for the project if you could get the water to exit the mine from there as opposed to the... It's been
bittersweet. It's bittersweet. Um, I think from an engineering perspective, yes, because that way we've got the lay of the land working for us. The right. stream flows this direction. This right. is lower than this. Right. And our, as I said earlier, our discharge is at the low point. So we've got to get the water up here somehow. Um, on the other hand, if the water comes out here, then we're occupying a larger percentage of the, pi of the site for A and B. Like taking that 10 acres comes right out of the middle. Right out of the middle. Instead of keeping it done on one end. And, and this berm is, is kind of neat because it does visually screen this side of the, uh, of the property, the south, southern edge, end of the property to the northern end. And granted, we're going to work very, very hard to make this aesthetically pleasing and educational and so on and so forth. But um, if it's up here, where my personal preference is, uh, you can come out and enjoy this, and then through a seen approach or eyes piece lens, that's part of the design, and bring people here to view the whole site. So it's bittersweet from my perspective. I think, I think Bob would say, let's take it up here. Uh, some of you may know me as uh, someone who donated a series of Nat Youngblood paintings to preserve this property uh, and through a series of transactions that generated $30,000 uh, to help uh, the Allegheny Land Trust purchase this. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was because I had come down here before it was sold while it was still a overgrown golf course and seen so much of the wonderful wildlife down here. And just about 20 minutes before you folks all came down, I met Bill Judd. Bill, Bill is uh, a leader of the Audubon Society. He was down here with his wife with binoculars. And he was reporting this amazing series of birds he was seeing right here in the spring. Um, so it just helps, you know, just, just knowing that helps confirm the fact in my mind that this is really, a, has, has, you know, is, has become a uh, worthwhile effort to preserve some very important property here. Only a month ago, Roy and I were down here. We believe we saw a bald eagle flying along Chartier's Creek. They don't, they don't nest here. They, they migrate. Uh, we've seen ospreys. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful, quiet, peaceful space that we should all have here in our suburban life. And uh, a lot of exciting things are being connected to that. There's a lot of activity and interest in preserving the entire Greenway coming down Chartier's Creek toward Bridgeville. Other organizations in Pennsylvania are interested in, in organizing our canoe trips and kayak trips to come down. Um, and thanks to this guy here, he's really putting it all together. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in a good phase here. We're looking at demolishing these buildings, um, 
and preserving this side over here, uh, converting it basically from a, a, a wasteland site that, can, that puts forth 2,000 gallons a minute of iron oxide and other poisonous materials into Chartier's Creek, trying to eliminate that through the creation of wetlands, which will actually enhance wildlife down here. Uh, that project will probably uh, take several years to happen, at least, but um, this is what it takes. So you folks are part of this. Many of you have supported us. So, Bob, you might want to say something from here. Um, we're about the middle of the site. This is the soil that was brought in from the Mayview wetlands that were created um, to mitigate the damage to wetlands that was created by the Southern Expressway that services the airport. Um, as I said, we're about the middle of the site, and to the north, we own to where you see the tree line. To the south, it's actually further than you can see. There's a couple pine trees, a telephone pole. It's, it's actually beyond that. Um, probably another another one of those distances, if you will. So the the uh, the other um, discharge possible discharge site is right around where the clubhouse is. If if you look at the mind maps. Uh, there was a porthole around that location, um, and the second one, well, the one we're primarily working on, is down in the north uh, east corner, and we'll we'll walk there. The stream is right along here. You can see the kind of the drop off there. The stream runs very very straight north to south. I'm sorry, south to north in this location. If you're looking at a map, you want to find this property. You'll see how Truckers Creek meanders, meanders, and all of a sudden it's this very <laughs> peculiar straightaway. And that's where we are, right through that straightaway. We're very, very close to the uh, Boyce Mayview Biological Diversity Area, which is a um, determination that was made by Western Pennsylvania Conservancy back in the early 90s when they did a countywide natural heritage inventory. And um, basically, it's a certified area that contains a high level of plant and animal life, a high biodiversity. And our mission is to target those areas and try to conserve land in those areas because that's where the best water is, the best plant diversity, and the best wildlife diversity is. This site is not in a BDA per se, but it's very, very close. Um, it's a buffer, if you will, to a BDA with the 500 acres that's conserved across the street by the township. We really start to create a critical mass and then, you know, Bob, uh, Rob alluded to what's going on downstream uh, with other conservation uh, initiatives and perhaps further upstream. We really need to have a trail run through here from, uh, say, Hendersonville, where the Montour Trail is, come on down the stream and hook up with the Panhandle Trail or whatever. It'd be a nice way to make a loop. So, Bob, do you want to add anything at this point? I'll add the boring part about the site. I mean, in the early 1940s, if, I think you can see how the ground is up there. Th that, that cliff there is not natural. That was done by the mining activity. So you have to figure that this is well, the creek has been changed too, but the, the, water, the, the land would have sloped down to, to the creek here. Below us about, from down there, 20 feet below the surface, the original surface, was the Pittsburgh coal seam. Pittsburgh coal seam is the coal seam that was mined, is mined in, in the Longwall mining, is the Pittsburgh coal seam, it was mined all in western Pennsylvania. It was the coal that made Pittsburgh what it was in the industrial part. Um, that is located underneath these hills here, and in this area where the where mining was, where the, the coal was accessible just by removing 20, 30 feet of rock, it was, the rock was blasted, pushed aside, and, and the, the, mine, the coal was strip mined, and that's what this site was, and in fact, when we get down here, for those of you who want to even just go look quickly, on the other side of the discharge, there's unreclaimed mine spoils, and there's the, the spoils go up and down. Nobody put any effort in reclaiming them. There's a, there's a big pond back there that some of you know about. Um, but th that is unreclaimed mine spoil. But then once, you get, once they mined, they eventually got to a point where it was just too expensive to move all this non-coal material to get at the coal, and that's where they started the deep mine. And the deep mine, as Roy said, the main portal was, was over in here. And actually, this road is, is on the mine map. It's called Red Dog Road, and Red Dog is is burnt shale. It's, it's what happens when, when a, a pile catches on fire. That's where our cars are, I think. And so I think where the building is, all of that was open. And then you can see that was all filled in, I suspect, by the, in the, well, well, by somebody during the golf course construction. And that's when they 
apparently buried the discharge, the, that entry. Um, then the other main entry is, is down here, and that's the one we're going to go to. They left a barrier of coal in here, actually for safety, because the, it's dangerous to mine when the, when, there's, when the overburden is fractured, and you don't want to mine too underground when it's this shallow. So they left a barrier of coal in here, which acts as a barrier for the water, too. There's water backed up in this, in this hill, and, but it's placed, right now the only place to come out is right over here. So as a result, though, this material this material we're standing on is real nice soil that you could, you'd love to have in your backyard for a garden. This is taken out of a wetland. Almost all, all the material that we dug in down here is just the overburden that was all ripped up, and so it's very, it's called spoil. It's very permeable, usually in many cases, and it's, um, it's, um, we have to see whether it's good enough to build berms out of it, whether we'll use this or how we'll do that. Is that, that through the entire site that's all been strip mining? You believe so? Yeah, it looks like. It looks like it, yeah. And it also looks like we may be standing near the old stream channel, Chartier's Creek. It, it had made a bend in here, and somewhere in here, and then it got straightened and pushed over there. So when you try to figure out the history of this site, that's important, too, because there probably wasn't any coal where the old, where the old Chartier's Creek was. Creek would have, creeks go through coal quickly. It's easy to erode through that. So um, as Bob mentioned in the classroom, we do have some off-site water coming across the site. This is a a tributary, this little valley valley here that, that comes down, it's flowing pretty good right now. Um, if you see that small rise where the uh, tree stumps and whatnot are, right behind it, that's full of water, that's a channel of water. It's taking water that's coming out of that small valley and, and running um, to the north towards our site and onto the uh, adjacent property owner uh, property. You'll also see some birdhouses. That was an Eagle Scout project, uh, some Aruba houses, and we did see some bluebirds here last week or yesterday. Um, so there's, you know, there's been some community activity here, and it's, it's kind of, kind of, um, you know, that's that, that's really our, our our attitude is we've we've approached this project with open arms and open minds, really. And um, when we were approached by the scouts to do the project for the for the bluebird, yeah, great, that, that's good. So we're trying to help, you know, in, in that respect by providing a resource for the scouts and whoever else to, to you know, do projects on the property. Anything else from this point? Okay, why don't we walk up this way, and you'll see how, how the land uh, undulates a little bit, and if you're you know, sharp, you'll see where there's, if you're a golfer, you'll see what used to be <laughs> the, the peas and the greens. Um, and our destination is that grove of pine trees to the north, and right about there is where the stream goes in, where the AMD goes into the stream. Rob. Uh, just two things in terms of acknowledgments. In terms of acknowledgments, uh, the Upper St. Clair Citizens for Land Stewardship contributed $17,000 by raising uh, uh, awareness within the community, and uh, they should certainly be credited for helping us confirm the, uh, the final purchase of the property. And also, the township of Upper St. Clair is helping us with some of the fill and demolition for these buildings. So we, we should thank them, too. Good point. I brought up CLS at the meeting earlier. And okay, well. I forgot about the township, but they do deserve some credit. And uh, the ALO Family Foundation uh, provided some funding. Um, SCAFE Family Foundation, um, Sneed Reinhardt, uh, the State Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, um, and uh, Laura Foundation. So a lot of the Pittsburgh you know, local foundations supported this project over the, over the years, and we, we look forward to more support. Uh, a lot of the uh, DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Community Economic Development is providing funding for uh, building demolition. So there's a lot of players, a lot of, a lot of partners in this project. So this is, the discharge is up there along the high wall, along that cliff there. It flows down this channel, and obviously this is where it enters Chartier's Creek. This is the first input of polluted water, um, polluted mine drainage into Chartier's Creek. Chartier's Creek is very high here today, and so it's having, I'm sure, negligible effect on the creek today. During low flow, when you can walk across here, 
there actually is an orange stain that extends for some, some distance downstream. I don't think we should fool anybody into thinking that the creek is not killed by this discharge, but it does degrade the creek, and this is a, the first one that we've got to start with. Um, you can see the beavers had actually dammed up right from this narrow spot. You can see where anybody would want to build a dam, where the beavers did. They had a dam in there that was about four feet high, and you can see on the sides all the orange staining, how high the water got when, when they did that. The, be the dam um, has since gone away. That's what happens with beaver dams usually. They, they, they go away. The beavers will probably be back this summer. Um, and as you walk around here, you'll see lots of evidence of the, all the food that they've eaten, all the, all the food. I was here in January and walking around down here and found the beavers laying out on the ice when the creek was frozen and laying out there. So they're, they're here. And they're looking big and fat, so I'm sure they'll be back. This is the unreclaimed mine spoil. If anybody wants to continue to walk, there's a, actually a kind of a nice trail once you get up the hill there. Um, you can see what surface mining does when there's no reclamation, and it just goes up and down and up and down, and probably what this site looked like before the golf course came in here and flattened things out. Um, this is the edge of the property, though. It would be eventually, as we was talked about, we need eventually to, to get have this piece of property be, be obtained so that this would connect right, I believe, into the park in Chartier's Park, I believe. So it would be a, a neat thing to add to this project. What kind of trees? Well, there's, um, there's willows in here. And I don't see much aspen, but they love aspen. I would guess, and some birch. I think there's birch in here that they're eating. We'll see, we'll find some pieces and see if we can find what they're eating. Um, they scrape the bark off, yeah. I think they actually do eat the bark, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's what they eat. But then they use the big pieces, of course, to build their, their dams. Really? Hmm. I think I if you, it seems like they, they chop off anything that they find in their way, you know, whether they're going to eat it or not. So um, I think the thing to do is to walk up here and to go see the discharge. This, this might be something for anybody who wants to go for a little extra walk to go look at the, um, the pond over there, which is called Lynch's. Lynch's Pond. It's really nice. It's a nice area if you like unreclaimed strip mine. And we came down one day, and the beavers up here had done their thing. In the term of the month, it was incredible how fast that went together. And this had come up, and the high water mark on here now is where it was then. And it stayed there for a, probably four months when something disturbed the beaver down here, and the dam broke. Mm -hmm. And the water began to go down and just began to go down. But that's as low as I could talk. Come out of there. Obviously, it must still come out at various times. But I've seen it come out in in large amounts. You mean orange orange water coming out? Not I orange. Be, I, I had my hand on there. Okay. <laughs> Not orange water per se. The precipitate, like, is laying on top of the water. It would come out just like a scum. Hmm. It wasn't oily. It just was this scum, like you see laying over there. And then you would not see it for a very, very long time, just flowing what appears to be clear. Mm -hmm. But um, it has really changed significantly over, over time. Well, what this, okay, this water is, we looked down in there as best we could yesterday, and now we can see a little bit better, but there's a pipe in here. These are in four foot sections. These concrete things are apparently, we could see three pieces of concrete section. The bottom one has an opening that heads in that way, and our map show the mine entry right in here somewhere. 
So th this all makes sense. There was a mine entry here that's below us. It was buried, and there was a wet seal put in here on purpose to let the water out. Why that hole was punched in there, nobody knows. Okay. Um, what the plan? Is, okay, and the water's coming out very clear, but that could, that's 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 um, misleading. The water has iron in it, and in fact, water coming out with can have very a lot of iron in it. It'll be crystal clear because it takes oxygen to to get the iron to form a solid. And if you were to take a glass of that home with you and shake it up and leave it on your desk tomorrow morning, tonight it would be orange, and tomorrow morning there'd be an orange set. Of, it'd be clear again, but it'd be orange sitting on the bottom of, of your glass. And that is what happens eventually. That's why this pond, it doesn't get aerated. There's not very good aeration here. And so it doesn't get aerated. And in fact, the, the reactions are slow enough. They don't happen until the, the water's in the creek. What we're going to do here, though, is hold it back and build big ponds all in here and hold back the water for at least 24 hours, target 48 hours, and in that amount of time, and we're going to aerate as best we can, we're going to cause the iron to form a solid in here, not in the creek. Well, we're going to put it in ponds. Right now, this, right now, it's only in here for minutes, you know, maybe an hour. We're going to build big ponds. To pond to pond, yes. Yes. What we learned yesterday, and I think we're going to go see a hole here, is that one of the challenges is that the groundwater level in here is very close. And so that makes, and you can see the water sitting on the surface. We've also found some clay in some areas here. But um, that's going to mean, it's going to be, it would be difficult to dig down. So that's why we want to go up if we can. And the beavers have shown us that we can go up that far, you know. Mm -hmm. that, that's what they showed us. And the water kept flowing at a very high rate. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I, when I saw it, it was still flowing at oh, a high yeah. rate. You know. It was. When we if, knew it was coming out of there. I've heard of miners who have had a situation like this, and they raise it to try to make life easier, and the discharge just stops. Well, that means it went somewhere else. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what we hope what we hope to do here is to get in here and actually collect the discharge into a solid pipe, and then. By manipulating that, be able to raise it very slowly and see, we'll raise it. And what will happen is you'll, raise, you'll put a, a panel in and raise it 12 inches. It'll stop flowing because now it's going to have to flood all the mine back up in here for six inches, which will be acres and acres. But once it fills up that, then it'll come out again. And we'll measure the flow rate. And as long as all the water keeps coming back, we'll keep raising it. My hope is that we can raise it a, about another three feet higher than it's been, than the beavers got it. And if we get it up to that, which is about, 830 feet. The site we're looking at out here is about 826 feet. And that starts to give us enough room that we can have little waterfalls and we can make water flow in that direction. The nice thing about if we can get the water high enough and going this way, to me, I think an option of having 1,500 gallons per minute of clean water to send down to the other part of the site as an educational benefit, as a whatever, to, could be kind of neat if we, we can maintain some of our elevation. If we start there and come this way, we have no choice but just to oh. lose the water. It's whether the trust thinks, I mean, that's a stream. Mm -hmm. You could build a stream down through the rest of the site and that, you know, do some neat stuff. So your settling basins, uh, what, you're going to have two of them, you think, and then the, uh, the wetlands? We'll probably have more like four basins and four ponds in here. Because the idea, too, is we want to have enough ponds that when we're cleaning one out, we can turn oh, off and, yeah, and yeah. still have the system work. These are four foot yeah, pieces. Does to this kind of water down in Donaldson's Crossroads is they treat it with, they aerate it, they pump it, they aerate it, they add lime to it, and then they form a sludge that they then have to pump into, into to dispose of. And that's what we can't do here. And that's what passive treatment is all about, is, is doing it all passively without any of those things. But the, the cost is, you have to let the reaction, what we learned is that we ha these, the iron will precipitate at a rate that usually you can afford by building a big, huge system. And then you don't have to add chemicals. Chemicals make the rates go faster, and we could treat all this water in two acres if we added chemicals. But so we can do this. This is the right water. We can do this passively if we can hold it back in here for 48 hours. And it just takes a challenge to do that and not have it short circuit, not, you know, to have the water truly be retained for that long in here. Yeah, they have a pH in the sixes down there. Sixes, yeah.
the issue. Yeah. So it hadn't hit the lab yet, but there was no orange that formed. The hole that we dug yesterday, we dug a series of holes around here. You can see some of the white stakes that we put in. That was so that we can see how, how we, we look in them, we'll see how high the water is inside those pipes. It'll t give us an idea of how high the groundwater is. This one tells us how high the groundwater is. Yeah. Um, it's very close to the surface. And so it was, this is an important, and also if you look at the material here, we actually found some clay in this hole. That's what that, that gray stuff is. But um, a lot of just soil mixed with spoil, and um, this will make, we just need to know this. Now we know this, so we need to take that into account. It makes raising the discharge ever that much more important in my mind. Or we'd have to drain the site, and we still may need to do that, but we'd have to go through that, that, whole, ish, that whole process. And we will, we will explore that down the road here, whether we should try to drain the site. But you know, we, 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 this was the second hole, third hole we dug. Um, it started coming in. Dug two more holes, I came back to put the stakes and it was overflowing actually. It was actually overflowing. And then it settled down to that. So it may be a half hour to fill up. And some of the holes, talk about the, the hole. Yeah, okay. Oh yeah. yeah. We, we, we dug some holes in the middle of the site and we found a, a black clay, a very tight black clay in three or four holes in the middle of the site. And one of them we got, I, we said, just keep digging. And he got it down about six feet and it was dry, and then suddenly the bottom, just the clay on the bottom started just like bubbling, and we had an artesian flow that came up and ended, ended up filling the hole like this. So there's pressure, even though there's areas where there's not groundwater, there's pressure, there's this much pressure everywhere. Right. Everywhere in the site, there's this much head pushing. So. That's shale. Yeah. Okay, so that is the site um, called Wingfield Pines. We knew that we had the abandoned mine uh, drainage problem here when we bought the property and um, took on the challenge of mitigating this source of pollution into Chartier's Creek. Uh, it would have been a lot easier to walk away from this project and uh, uh, allow the flow to continue into Chartier's Creek like it has been for decades, but as a conservation organization, we felt it was the right thing to do to uh, take on this challenge to mitigate this problem. Fortunately, there's funding at the state level to design these programs and to construct these uh, passive treatment systems to minimize the pollution in Chartier's Creek and other streams throughout western Pennsylvania. To learn more about this project and the Allegheny Land Trust, you can visit alleghenylandtrust.org.